Вітаю вас! Мене звати Олександр Пренкевич. Ви на YouTube-каналі Література Плюс. На каналі, на якому ви зможете поспілкуватися, побачити на власні очі найкращих інтелектуалів, які творять літературу. Ви також можете стати співучасниками сучасного літературного процесу. Підписуйтесь на канал і ставте лайки. I am really honored to introduce our keynote speaker for today, and this is Astrid Fellner. So she is chair of North American Literary and Cultural Studies at Saarland University in Saarbrück in Germany, and as far as I understood, also Dean of Studies, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, also, she is co-editor in the German Research Foundation and Canadian Social Science uh, Foundation funded interdisciplinary international graduate research training program, Diversity Mediating Difference in Transculture Space, that Zarland University and University of Trier are conducting with the University of Montreal. She is project leader of the EU-funded Interact project University of the Great Region Center for Border Studies and is action coordinator of a trilingual border glossary. She is also the co-founder of a tri-national and trilingual MA program in border studies. Uh, he has lots of publications and uh, several edited volumes and articles in fields of border studies, US Latino Latina literature, post-revolutionary American literature, Canadian literature, indigenous studies, gender, queer studies, and cultural studies. The theme of uh, the presentation today is theorizing cultural border studies from borderscapes to border texturing. Without further ado, sir, I'm really glad to invite Astrid P uh, Fellner to introduce your ideas to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for this kind introduction. I'm happy to see uh, so many familiar faces here. I understand that you are all scholars of literature primarily, right? And that you have had some experience with the field of border studies. Uh, I'm also happy to see uh, some of my students here and my colleagues. I see um, uh, uh, you've mentioned these projects. Of course, I don't do them alone. And I'm happy to see students um, and graduates from both the RUTG diversity as well as the MA Border Studies. And I'm also happy to see the coordinator of our Interreg Project uh, Center for Border Studies, um, uh, Christian Wille from University of Luxembourg, who's also here today. Hello, thank you for joining us. And uh, you know, to all of you, you know, please jump in and help me you know, if I've left something out. Um, and I will uh, you know, present uh, of course, also the, the Center for Border Studies to you in a moment. I will share my screen with you, and I hope that you all uh, can see uh, what, I, what I have here. Um, I have a lot of PowerPoint slides. I could go on forever. I, 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 have, I have about 60 minutes to go. Do you think that's okay, or is that too long? because you said 40 to 60 minutes, and then and I thought, great, yeah, I can 60 do 60 minutes. It's perfect, and then we will have discussion. Okay, all right, so that's, that's cool. Um, because what I wanted to do uh, really here is I wanted to, and this is my first slide here, I wanted to kind of, you know, lay out the, the, this emerging field of what we call, or what we in our uh, Center for Border Studies have come to call uh, cultural border studies. So I really want to focus on recent developments of how the field has uh, emerged. And because this is a, a, a literature group here in which ways borders and aesthetics, so the whole question of uh, representations, cultural representations of borders, how that is related. I would also like to present to you theories and methods with which to approach uh, border narratives and, and cultural practices that in some ways deal um, with the border. And last but not least, I would like to trace some uh, theoretical concerns and concepts that have been used in order to theorize borders. And here I would like to particularly focus on 
the concept of um, of border textures, and I would like you know to trace it. And this is uh, why my talk is called "From Borderscapes," which I think is the the by by far um, uh, better known uh, concept to uh, the concept of border textures, which is a concept that we are currently developing um, um, in in our Center for Border Studies. So that's uh, basically uh, my, you know, what I want to do. And I've decided to uh, proceed in a very orderly way today. I hope I will be able to stick to it. I would like to, uh, you know, divide my talk into, into three parts. And then I will also uh, offer you three ways and three dimensions. So everything is kind of like tripart uh, today in my talk. But I would like to start out by giving you a short uh, a glimpse of what we're doing here at the Center of Border Studies. I would like to, uh, you know, talk about um, uh, uh, border studies in general. Uh, and I don't know, I can skip a lot of this if this is kind of old news to you. Um, but I think it's important to actually situate this um, uh, new field of cultural border studies. And uh, when we situate it, I would like to show to you how it has developed. And then last but not least, and this is the main part, um, uh, talk about concepts and, and theories. So uh, uh, Tatiana has you know, already mentioned this in the introduction. This is kind of our, our big project here and, and, um, and our baby really, I have to say, the, the uh, uh, um, Center for Border Studies, the University of the Greater Region Center for Border Studies. For those of you who wanna know where that is, you know where we are. I offer this map here, which is actually our advertising material for our master's program here. So I am situated in Saarbrücken, which is uh, uh, kind of this little uh, blue um, uh, thingy here, uh, smack in the middle of, of, of Europe and the area uh, here is called the uh, Greater Region and you see it's an area uh, and there's a, <clears throat> a network of uh, our universities here of six partner university, uh, four countries in uh, uh, Germany, uh, the two states of Saarland and the, the, the blue, uh, deeper blue one is Rhineland Palladium and then Luxembourg and, um, and Lorraine. These are the four participating countries in, in our uh, sorry, the three participating countries in our uh, Master for Border Studies. But then, of course, we also have um, uh, Belgium uh, as um, another partner, Liège, in our Center uh, for Border Studies. Okay, so this is to put you on the map. And of course, we have a website. And um, I, of course, encourage you to uh, check us out because we have a lot of um, things going on in terms of lectures. We also right now, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Christian can add the link in the chat because I forgot to include a, um, a slide. We also currently actually have a call out for a visiting professorship. So we invite um, applications from uh, border studies scholars, international scholars who would like to come visit us. So if you wanna do that, um, we can send you the link. It's all on this on this website here. Uh, we have uh, a, a strong teaching component. So this is the, the Master of Border Studies that I have hinted at, uh, which is uh, kind of the, the backbone, so to speak, when it comes to uh, the training of, of young uh, uh, students. And so we actually, uh, you know, produce, so to speak, border studies. Uh, experts, um, and this is of course something that we're very proud of. We also have a strong research component, and I advertise this also because these are things where you all also can become part of, or should I say have already become part of. Uh, all of these um, uh, publishing venues here are are open or will be open at some point. We have a knowledge and documentation center, uh, we have a, a digital glossary um, uh, that I um, um, am re responsible for, which Tatiana has also mentioned. We have a publication series and we also have a blog. And so, for instance, you can easily uh, contribute to, to the blog. And when it comes to publications, I'll just run you through these um, uh, next slides here because they all kind of zoom in on these aspects. This is the glossary here, which is in the making. And uh, when it comes to our publications, 
uh, we have a working paper series and policy paper and we have thematic issue. And so here, for instance, uh, Tatiana, um, uh, Ivan Nossem and I are currently actually co-editing uh, a thematic issue, uh, the biopolitics of borders in times of, of crisis. So this is something um, that is open um, to, to all of you. And this is, of course, not something that will be finished, but there will be another call and there will be other uh, opportunities. And concerning border ops, I don't know, the last one actually uh, was in June and that was mine, but I think it's still open, right? Uh, uh, Christian, who's also here, I think, you know, if you still want to contribute and write a blog piece on uh, the situation of uh, COVID-19 and, and, and border, um, uh, the closing of borders or, you know, uh, related issues, then please feel free to uh, contribute and, and send us um, uh, a blog entry. Okay, and then there's also a series of working groups. And again, uh, I do this because I, I want to situate the research that I am doing. What I'm presenting today is not uh, kind of um, stuff that I'm doing um, alone. I have uh, I come to work uh, and really appreciate also collaborative research. This is something fairly new uh, for people in the humanities. I don't know how this is, you know, uh, how it's you know, the situation is for you, but usually in literature we're used to working on our own. But uh, all of the all of the things that I'm going to present today are kind of uh, the result of work that I have been doing uh, collaboratively, uh, foremostly with Christian Wille, who is here, with whom I co-teach uh, a class, and uh, I hope at some point we can also write an introduction to to uh, cultural border studies as well as to the many other members in, in our working group. As you can see here, we have a working group uh, called Border Textures, and this is the, the working group uh, in which we uh, collaboratively also try to develop uh, this uh, concept of border textures, about which I will talk in a moment. Alrighty, so um, let's see. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I'll offer you kind of a, uh, an avenue, or I tried to open up uh, a window into, into this kind of jungle of border studies and cultural border studies, and uh, how I kind of uh, uh, map the field, or should I say how uh, Christian Wille and I uh, have come to map the field in order to uh, try to define the uh, decidedly cultural studies focus within this large field of border studies. So now I'm, I'm briefly talking about the, the institutional level, right? Kind of the field of border studies, um, which I think is important uh, to talk about first before you can then actually zoom in on cultural border studies and see kind of what topics it concerns itself and so on and, and where it can be uh, taught. So uh, I'll start with a slide that uh, Christian Wille and I are using uh, in our Master for Border Studies, um, which um, uh, always is great fun to talk about because this is a, um, a picture that I think speaks to, to all of us here when kind of two uh, whales, I guess, right? They're talking to each other and the baby whale says, mama, how do we know when we've crossed the border, right? How do we know when we've crossed one ocean uh, to another? And, and mama whale then kind of says, well, we don't. Borders are socially constructed. She must have attended one of our classes, right? Um, borders are socially constructed and you should be wary of anyone who takes them too seriously. So be careful or take, you know, good caution, so to speak, if, if there are people out there who take borders seriously. And needless to say, you all know that there are plenty of people out there, of course, who take borders seriously and who, who want to uh, uh, really enforce borders and who very much participate in what in border studies we have come to call bordering practices, practices um, in the sense that then borders also serve as demarcation lines. Well, um, <clears throat> you already saw that I shifted my vocabulary from borders to bordering and bordering practices. Uh, and I think this is the, the, the first kind of uh, 
uh, conviction that we have in border studies that borders are, um, I should, sorry, I don't have that slide here, that borders are socially constructed, that they are kind of the result of specific uh, historical cultural um, uh, processes. So we, we, we operate from what we call a processual understanding of borders, not as entities, as, as kind of givens, but as, um, as socially uh, constructed animals, I say now for lack of a, of a better term. So if I, whoops, what happened here? If I come to a definition of, of border studies, I refer you to, to two definitions. One is how we actually advertise our masters in border studies. And, uh, uh, and this is kind of uh, uh, very much connected, of course, to the historical situation. Border studies, you could say, is, is pretty much a uh, post-1989 uh, phenomenon, especially in, in Europe. So it does have something to do with um, uh, the fall of the Iron Curtain. And um, it's definitely something that now, of course, is gaining um, uh, even more importance in, in, uh, in a situation in which uh, uh, we're um, um, going through a phase which we call uh, rebordering. So where in uh, the late uh, 80s, you know, we, we entered this phase of debordering and there were even kind of theories out there, right, that spoke of a borderless world and so on. We now know um, that uh, we're experiencing um, um, processes of debordering, uh, sorry, rebordering. So this is a pretty much a, a standard definition of uh, border studies. Uh, and as you can see, as a, as a field, uh, as a field of studies also, as a field of research, it is uh, very uh, interdisciplinary. And I have to stress that because you will see that a lot of um, articles, a lot of books, a lot of uh, uh, stuff that is out there in the field of border studies actually comes uh, from disciplines like geography, spa spatial planning, political science, and so on and so forth. And I have this next slide here which actually shows the development of border studies. This is a slide that I have taken over from, uh, from Christian Villa here. He is the one who, who did uh, his homework here and looked at um, the, the development of the field um, by looking at um, associations. So if you look at uh, 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 North America, it was actually 1976 that the Association for Borderland Studies was founded. Um, and this is, I, I guess, a key moment or the Journal for Border Studies. Um, and, you know, these, I think, two um, institutions really are kind of the key uh, instruments, you could say, also for the development of, of border studies. If you look at it, you see that in Europe, you know, uh, the institu institutionalization of border studies came a little later, but if you look at it, you see that there's a lot going on or has been a lot going on in the past 10 years. We have a series of uh, uh, centers for border studies or programs in border studies. And as you can see here, uh, our University of the Greater Region Center for Border Studies is, is smack in the, in, the middle, in the middle of it. Um, as I've said before, um, a lot of these uh, centers, if you look at their websites, uh, do focus on um, <clears throat> uh, 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 what we in, in our master's program have, have uh, come to call kind of spatial issues, uh, looking at borders uh, in uh, uh, very much also from an understanding of borders being territorial, either lines or um, uh, uh, border lands or border scapes um, and, and do not really focus so much on, on uh, cultural issues. And this is where kind of now we, if we look at the development, we, we notice that in, in past years there have been a couple of centers and our center certainly is one of them. But also if you look at uh, the upper corner here, 2012, the culture in the Canada US border network, um, you see that there is, uh, you know, uh, a, a decided focus here on on cultural issues. So it's it's kind of um, 
uh, beginning, you can, you can see that, you can say that, well, uh, in the past 10 years, you know, there has been kind of a dividing up, so to speak, of the field when kind of um, a, a focus on cultural issues became prominent. And with that, of course, also a redefinition of what um, uh, a border really means and in what ways you can also apply uh, the, the, the concept to, to other uh, borders than quote unquote just uh, territorial borders. And we do that, as I've said, in different disciplines, in different uh, 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 um, also uh, departments, I guess, because this is what they usually then translate when you talk about the institu institutionalization of these disciplines at universities. And you see that we do now have uh, not only spatial planning and geography and political science, but of course with cultural studies and ethnic studies, history, linguistics, religious studies, literary studies, anthropology, and so on, all wanting to have a say, you could say, in uh, the development of, of cultural border studies. So they all kind of work together. And I think each discipline, of course, has to offer uh, their own uh, terms and their own concepts and their own um, uh, uh, premises, so to speak. And um, so the field has become, you could say, very, very diverse uh, and very heterogeneous at the same time. Also, of course, very exciting because you have uh, a branching out really of different, um, of different ideas. So if I were to uh, map the field, um, I will show that to you how I would do that. Um, I differentiate, uh, and this is again uh, a slide that um, uh, Christian Wille um, has uh, composed and that we use in our Master for Border Studies. We differentiate between three dimensions of borders, right? So uh, I think this will help also uh, in classifying the many ideas that you will receive on that, uh, what is it, word cloud or, or blog, the website that uh, Svetlana just mentioned. Um, you can look at when uh, someone says something concerning borders, whether that refers to what we refer to as the territorial dimension of the border, uh, kind of the, the, the um, very often the, the line, right, the border, the boundary. Um, which very much, of course, falls within the reign of space and politics, or the social dimension of the border, which kind of opens it up a little bit, the understanding of, of border. So it adds uh, social uh, dimension, both in the sense also of, of uh, 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 using borders as something that you can perceive on the one hand as a border, uh, but also you know, in terms of meaning making and so on, um, and action. And then the symbolic dimension. So we speak about, you know, word boundaries. We speak about borders that are uh, 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 felt in, in, in a very uh, metaphorical way. And we can, um, you know, and I think, <clears throat> of course, when we speak about literature and how borders figure in literary texts, very often they figure within the symbolic dimension, you could say. So we've circled here these two dimensions, the second and the third, because I think it is primarily the social dimension as well as the symbolic dimension, which is activated or which are activated when we talk about borders in literary texts. Of course, there is also the territorial dimension. Of course, very often we, we also find uh, on the level of plot uh, a text that is actually situated, you know, the story actually is set right on the border. We also find that. Um, but um, of course, there's also border crossing narratives that do not necessarily um, uh, involve uh, physical or territorial borders, but for instance, uh, uh, very much talk about the crossing, for instance, the, uh, in terms of race and ethnicity, crossing the color line, for instance, of course, that is a, a border too. And this is, I think, what falls within that category of social dimension and, and, and the symbolic dimension of the border. So I think this is very important to, to have in mind. 
I would now like to come back to uh, um, uh, what I said earlier when I said that different disciplines bring with them, you could say, also their own uh, concepts and theories and tools. So it, it's, 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 I find it pretty difficult to say, well, these are the theories and concepts of cultural borders. That is because we borrow a lot of these terms uh, from uh, disciplines. Um, and I think it's very important to, to acknowledge that. So if I now look at um, how uh, cultural border studies has developed and and now focus on this on this cultural aspect here, or as I've just said, on these two dimensions, I come to the following conclusion, and I will want to share my my um, mind map with you. I'll skip the other one because you can read up on that later. And I would like to share my uh, mind mapping the field, and I'll zoom in now into these different arms here. I usually. Uh, 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 need to kind of uh, lay it out here in front. Um, and so this is how I kind of see um, how the field of, of cultural border studies can be, can be mapped. I do think that there is, um, these are the arms, so to speak, a uh, study of uh, borders that was conducted way before the field of border studies or cultural border studies uh, was put on the map. Uh, there have been uh, lots of disciplines that have concerned themselves with borders without that ever really be mentioned uh, or classified as border studies. So I think that is very important uh, to know. You could say that in literature, uh, we've always dealt with borders, so to speak, yeah? Um, the question then is, you know, uh, can that be studied also under a cultural border studies lens? Um, but that's a different, uh, different question. But as I said, I do think there is a, a history. And then, of course, there is the, the, the development of the, of the specific field of, of border studies and cultural border studies that has certain roots and intellectual traditions. Then I do think there are certain key uh, theories and concepts that come with key thinkers. Uh, uh, then, as with all fields, you know, there's uh, privileged kind of sites of analysis. Uh, I always tell my students that this is kind of the playground, right, where all of these theories are kind of played out or where we can actually uh, uh, derive our topics. And, uh, and then there's fields of research, key topics, and theories on of borders. So I'll, I'll zoom in now and then I think things will become clear. I've already talked about that. So when we come to the, to the development, um, I do think that there are very um, uh, uh, clear precursors here. Uh, ethnic studies, the whole tradition of ethnic studies at um, North American universities, especially the field of Chicano Chicana studies, um, are clear uh, uh, precursors here. I feel like Chicano Chicana studies when it came of age in the 1960s and 1970s very much already sold itself, so to speak, as uh, a field that is very much focused on, on the border. And so does postcolonial studies. Postcolonial studies in, in different disciplines now again, um, but foremostly in, in literary studies has a long tradition on focusing on the periphery, the, the margin yeah, of, of empires. Um, so again, I think there's a, a, a long um, intellectual tradition there. Then of course, the field of cultural studies uh, when we talk about cultural border studies. So that first um, part of that, uh, of that phrase, uh, which of course comes out of in cu cultural studies, of course, is yet another studies that has its own, its own development uh, or the German uh, tradition thereof, which is slightly different. I have no idea how um, that would be called in, in your respective, um, university contexts, but I, I, um, I know for sure, of course, that you also um, uh, <clears throat> are familiar with 
these other, I still don't have the right name for that, you know, post-structuralism, Marxism, I call them intellectual traditions uh, for lack of a, of a better term. And, and, the, and the list goes on, so to speak. Um, all of these have given us certain terms and names that we now rely on in border studies. So for instance, I give you some examples here. Uh, the notion of borderlands uh, to begin with, the notion of third space. So uh, borderlands is usually associated with Gloria and Saldua, uh, and it comes out of, I would, if I were to classify it, uh, Chicano Chicana studies. Third space, a concept that we're all familiar with um, when it comes to post-colonial studies and usually associated with uh, Homi Baba, right? Uh, also, first of uh, when it came out in the early 90s, very much also uh, focused on the post-colonial situation in, in India, right? Contact zone, a very useful term, I believe, but a term that comes very, very uh, clearly out of Latin America. So we associated with Mary Louise Pratt, who uh, in her, in her um, uh, studies very clearly referred to that moment in Latin America where the indigenous tradition uh, kind of was still uh, uh, to be felt and in struggle with the hegemonic uh, tradition of the colonizer. Um, and she refers to that space as the contact zone. Um, hybridity very difficult concept, also very often associated with uh, Homi Baba. Um, and the show goes on, right? Transculturality, alterity, um, then more recently decolonization or decoloniality, uh, also very, very, very uh, strongly um, <clears throat> associated with uh, Latin America, especially the work of um, Walter Minolo. And then the, 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 and I, the list here could go on. I, I've picked Métisage because I wanted a, a French one. I could also, I will suggest that in a moment to you, Mestizaje. Um, not the same, but different, similar, let's put it that way. Um, uh, also kind of like hybridity, kind of a, a mixing uh, of two different uh, influences here. So if I may speed up here, because all of these names that I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, concepts that I have mentioned here usually kind of uh, go together. Uh, so here I listed Bolton, who is actually the first one to have coined the, the term um, uh, borderlands before Ansaldua picked it up. And then of course, uh, Ansaldua, Pratt, Minolo, uh, Glissant, uh, whom I've decided to include because I also wanted to uh, include the, the Caribbean, uh, situation. His, his work, I think, is, is wonderful and his concept of metissage also works very well. So these are all kind of the, as I've said, key thinkers whose concepts and theories um, we kind of bring in um, in this new field of cultural border studies. What do we do? These are the sites of analysis. What is, so to speak, our playground? I don't think I have to, to read this all. I can just show it to you. So I've said this is kind of uh, where we kind of find our cultural practices with which to engage um, if we now do border studies with a uh, very um, decided um, cultural focus. And uh, fields of research here, you know, this is very much how we translate all of this now into our curriculum, into our syllabus for our introduction to cultural border studies. These are actually the, the sessions of our classes. We always start out with borders and space and place. Uh, life tomorrow when we meet again, we do cultural identity and gender. Um, and then we move into aesthetics, the arts, bodies, uh, surveillance and I can't read the last one discourses. So this is basically how uh, it, 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 it transfers into a into a class syllabus. I thought that that's also something that you might be interested in. And my last uh, uh, slide here um, concerning my my map. Uh, no, it's not the last one, sorry, I have to bother you with more, is that these fields uh, are kind of again or can be subdivided or looked at from two dimensions. And I think this is also uh, very clear because on the one hand, we have a very clear, um, let me see if I have another one, which is 
which is better here, yeah. Um, aesthetic, artistic, and performative dimension. But at the same time, so this is when we look at cultural representations, border narratives, uh, border literature, and so on, or border art, um, or the performative tradition. But of course, if we talk about cultural border studies, um, there is also a very strong focus on what we in cultural studies uh, refer to as everyday culture, yeah, everyday lives. And this is what we refer to as the anthropological dimension. And I do think there is a, I think this is an interesting and important um, uh, distinction to be made that, um, that we are aware that both of these dimensions kind of um, uh, form part of, of cultural border studies. Okay, I always, as you know, have to shift kind of the, your, your, your pictures here so that I can continue to click. Uh, key con con uh, topics, lots of different topics. I don't think I have to, uh, you, you can imagine, right? Um, but I've just listed a, a, a couple of them. And you see here, of course, you know, it's intercultural communication. This is where multilingualism comes in. This is where inter transcultural entanglements, this is where ethnicity comes in, but also urban borders. So this is also just a, a very, very brief uh, 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 and short list here. And of course, this can be, can be extended. Now, this last kind of arm is, I think, where we currently now are putting most brain power into, because this is where we think that um, uh, a lot of work still needs to be done. And that is actually theorizing how we uh, talk about the border or with what kind of understanding of the border we operate uh, with when we do cultural border studies. And here also a series of concepts have been developed, a series of uh, books have come out. Um, and this is what I now would like to focus on um, when I present to you uh, how the border uh, and how kind of this um, uh, nexus between border and, and literature or border and cultural representation or border and aesthetic, um, as I, we also call it, how they come uh, together. And I would es uh, especially like to focus now on what you see on the very left, border thinking, border scapes, border aesthetics and, and border textures. Okay, so this is now when I turn to uh, concepts and theories here. So what I will try to do now is I will provide an overview and I've really tried to, again, uh, um, do this in a systematic way here of the extent to which borders, especially topographical borders, I in my work primarily uh, work with texts in the larger sense that do engage with uh, topographical borders. Yeah? So there is a, a, a concrete uh, uh, borderlands area involved or a concrete border. In my case, as an Americanist, I do work primarily on the US-Mexican and the US-Canada border, but um, I've also branched out. I do what is called, uh, what I call comparative border studies. I do work also on on the, the greater region here, but I'm also interested, you know this, and this is why I'm so keen on continuing to um, uh, work with you. We also work on Eastern borderlands and um, the, the Ukrainian uh, borderlands. I think this is a, a very fascinating um, uh, borderlands area as well. And so um, uh, I think, you know, this is why I'm so, you know, excited to, to work with you. Okay, so um, we are, or I am working, or what is at center is kind of um, representations, as I've said, of borders, aesthetic representations, be it, you know, liter literature or border art. Here today, I'll focus primarily on, on literature because I understand this is a, a, a literature conference here, so I'm not gonna say anything about um, uh, border art, but I zoom in on on, on what is or has come to be referred to as border literature. And there too, I think you can make a couple of distinctions. So on the one hand, again, you can say that uh, 
literary texts that in some ways or another concern themselves with topographical borders uh, have a long tradition. And in that sense, I think, um, uh, uh, or this is where uh, Chicano Chicana studies or Chicanex studies as it's called now comes in a, a literature that uh, from early on has very much put uh, the border between the United States and Mexico in the foreground. In, in fact, when it, uh, when it started, it started because a border was drawn between the United States and Mexico in 1848. This is the, the beginning of, of, of Chicano Chicana literature and therefore also of border literature, you could say. Um, if we uh, follow, uh, and the, the word, uh, the word, I'm sorry, the name Shimansky and Wolf will come out now because they are the two uh, critics who have really uh, provided us with a, a couple of books uh, now. I'll show them to you in a moment. Um, and they have focused on border aesthetics. If we look at the word aesthetics, if we look at what we mean when we talk you know, about um, aesthetic, an aesthetic dimension that a cultural representation um, uh, ought to have, um, we can come to the following um, understanding of the term aesthetics, because that of course is also something that we need to, that we need to think of yeah, when we talk about uh, this nexus uh, of, of border and aesthetics or border and, and literature, yeah? And, um, you know, I think it's better actually if we take the, the term aesthetics rather than just literature, because if we look into the etymology of that word aesthetics, you see, and I follow uh, Shimansky and Wolf here, you see that the, the meaning of, the etymological meaning of um, aesthetics has very much something to do with sensation and perception. And there is one quote that I want to share here with you, um, in, you know, which I think is very telling and shows you how cultural representations, yeah, the aesthetic dimension, so to speak, that is inherent in those cultural representations is always in some ways or another already connected to the border. So he says here, a border, they say, a border that is not sensed by someone or something is not a border. So a border cannot just exist out there. We know this, this is classic post-structural thinking also, right? This is a, a constructionist view of borders. We cannot make sense of, 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 uh, uh, you know, of anything out there if we don't manage to bring it into our meaning-making system which of course is, is language. But because aesthetics is that kind of uh, uh, theory, you could say, of, of, um, of, of sensing and of perceiving something, um, it, 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 you know, it, it brings the concept of, of, of borders and aesthetics very closely together. And you could really say then that borders are always in some ways or another actually inherently aesthetic. They have to be perceived as such. Yet, and I think it's very important, we need to, again, uh, in my kind of uh, systematization of the field here, we can again kind of um, make out different dimensions of that nexus that I've just laid out here, yeah, of this kind of coming together of, of borders and, and, um, and the aesthetic tradition here. And here I would like to uh, again, uh, present this to you in the form of, in a tripartite you know, way of three dimensions. And I hope that this is something that uh, uh, will, be, will be useful also um, when, when you further discuss kind of how uh, uh, borders and aesthetics uh, can, be, can be talked about. The, the first one, um, the first dimension that I, that I um, see is that you can uh, determine the extent to which the border itself can be actually seen as a place of development of aesthetic phenomena. Or if I, you know, this is a, a, a sentence here um, that I've decided to put on this slide, you can also say that if you, if you want to define kind of what, what falls under this, you know, uh, uh, category here of borders and dimension, you can say, well, a lot of writings out there, a lot of texts actually already show that the border itself um, is a privileged uh, place of innovative, usually avant-garde 
um, cultural production. And I have a couple of slides here that explain that in a moment. Let me first, you know, just give this brief overview here. Um, the second dimension is, uh, I think, the, 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 a long tradition by now of aesthetic representations and figurations of the border. This is where I think uh, border literature or Chicanx literature comes in. So aesthetic representations, texts that deal with the border, so to speak. Yeah? And the third dimension is, uh, as I've said um, before, kind of uh, very much um, the, uh, the field of border aesthetics, or uh, Brambilla calls it the, the politics aesthetics um, uh, nexus here, uh, kind of border as aesthetic. Um, and this is where, um, mm -hmm, wrong one here, uh, wrong direction, where um, uh, Szymanski uh, has produced a, a couple of uh, works recently, and he calls that field border aesthetics. Uh, for me, that is what, what he is working on is something very specific, um, but is really, this is how I see it, how I would classify it, a dimension in its own, right? Because he really wants to grasp what, and he's a literature person, he's a comparativist, so what in literary texts kind of makes for that special thing, you know, I'd say it like this, or the special consciousness or feeling or, or peppering or I don't know, um, you know, um, that accounts for uh, uh, what he then refers to as a special border aesthetics. And he then also comes up with all sorts of different um, class classifications here. But as I said, for me, that is a, a separate dimension that of course, uh, plays into the first uh, two uh, dimensions here, um, because of course that um, uh, you know these these three dimensions here over overlap. Okay, so let me come to my last uh, section here, uh, and these kind of three um, uh, dimensions in in detail, um, because I think they're very important. Now, the first one I think is very important and. Um, it goes back to a long tradition in post-colonial uh, literature, but it also goes back to, um, for instance, the writings of Kafka um, and, and the uh, uh, critic uh, Deleuze who, who wrote about um, uh, Kafka's writing in, in Prague, right? Uh, Kafka as a and now I lack the right term. When I went to school in Austria, we always referred to him as an Austrian writer. Uh, Germans claim it as a, him as a German writer. He certainly was not a Czech writer because he didn't write in Czech, but he was in, 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 in Prague, right? Um, a border writer, right? Um, uh, Deleuze refers to his, you know, or that type of writing as, uh, as minor literatures, but what, what he does and, and where he comes from is a, a place um, on the periphery, right? Of course, Prague was a center, but in terms of uh, German literature on the periphery. And, and this tradition or this kind of way of thinking that the periphery, so to speak, um, is then or, or, or has the potential of actually being a place where actually um, something happens, yeah, and something new comes up and something exciting comes up. I think this is a very interesting uh, thought for us um, and, and, and opens up a whole lot of uh, texts for us to analyze under this rubric of, um, uh, of border literature. So here is a classic definition of, of borderlands. And you could say that any text that comes out kind of of uh, a, a, an area or, uh, you know, um, in which kind of uh, usually situated um, at the periphery, uh, that this is kind of can be referred to as a, as a borderland area, a contact zone, yeah, a place where different cultures uh, come together. You have this moment uh, of the border as being a, a special place, a place of innovation. Um, already in this key text here, Borderlands La Frontera, 
which is kind of the, uh, 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 you could say, groundbreaking work in, in, in border literature and also in, in, in border studies and certainly in cultural border studies. And if you look at this quote here, uh, I'm now zooming in and focusing on the last term here, right? The merging uh, of two worlds forming a third country, a border culture. You see that this is kind of um, a new, there's something new which happens um, at, at on the border, right? If we were to theorize this, this is where concepts such as third space, Ansel Dua's understanding of borderlands, um, the colonial difference, um, all of these, the cultural difference, all of these kind of concepts, I think, refer refer to this. And this is where I think the, the postmodern, the postcolonial ways of thinking um, of, of, of the marginal as, as something uh, transgressive, where that kind of is, um, is rooted. So I, I would like to finish this section here with uh, this last quote that you see here um, um, at the very uh, bottom here, borderlands as the focus of in, uh, are the focus of interest, sorry for the typo, as was emphasized in criticism already, Chicano criticism in the 90s, because they can represent, and this is a quote here from an early uh, uh, text, 1997 here, as, as places of politically exciting hybridity, intellectual creativity, and moral possibilities. So a very positive, and for us in literature, very good news kind of definition, because you know the idea here is that um, uh, borderland spaces, uh, you know, produce a lot of literary texts, a lot of kind of um, intellectual uh, creativity going on. Now, this type of writing, these type of texts, they don't necessarily have to do, again, you know, with, with uh, the physical border, uh, but, you know, in some ways or another, they reflect uh, a certain consciousness. So, for instance, uh, Kafka didn't write about the border, right, but he wrote in, in German, in, you know, and then, you know, if you're in, 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 in uh, uh, linguistics, of course, you know, uh, uh, you also know, you know, heteroglossic situations and so on. So, what I, what I want to show here is that, you know, so this opens up a whole yet another dimension, you could say, of things that you can analyze then in, in, um, in literary texts. Um, okay, and I'll skip the next ones because these are kind of definitions of, of these texts. Um, uh, sorry, definitions that we associate with uh, this uh, consciousness. This is where Mr. Sache and so on comes in. Um, the second one, if I am not mistaken, I'm having difficulty seeing this, is actually uh, those texts that, uh, and I think this is the easiest category, by the way, because this is kind of the category of, you know, uh, a border literature or border writing texts, you know, that very much deal with the border um, and in which kind of the, the border also becomes a, a topos, so to speak. Um, and it is very often, of course, associated with uh, li literature of, of minorities or with migrants and so on. And I think this is, of course, um, uh, th probably those, um, um, uh, this definition refers to those texts that we usually associate with um, uh, border literature and with kind of um, uh, this uh, coming together of border and, and aesthetics. So I don't think I need to, to spend a lot of more time on that. However, I would like to say that, and this is where um, our first concept of border poetics comes in that Jemanski uh, uh, also has, has put forth, um, although he does it in a slightly uh, different way from how I would kind of come up with uh, a border poetics. I'm still looking for, for another term here because Jemanski has already used that term so, so prominently here. Um, and that is that kind of mm, makeup of, of these border writing texts in terms of genre, in terms of consciousness, in terms of the way in which they are written. Um, and, um, and yeah, I'm still looking for a, for a, for a term here. So I'll, I'll leave it, you know, at border poetics at this point. And uh, here again, these bullet points can be amended here. I just have kind of four. Uh, things that come to my mind um, that I have been interested in. 
um, and they are the following. So number one for me is multilingualism. You already see that when you have borderlands, la frontera, code switching, translanguaging, so some form of multilingual poetics. Uh, genre hybridity, a crossing of different uh, genres. Then, and this is complicated here, this uh, type of borderlands consciousness that uh, uh, Gloria Saldua talks about, and uh, uh, ways of writing. A lot of the texts that um, I find uh, very interesting as border literatures are um, written in um, a tradition that we also very much associate with uh, Latin America, and that is magical realism. A lot of texts include indigenous uh, uh, features and, and specific border figures and figurations such as um, the trickster. So we have literary devices, so to speak, that you associate or can associate with border writing. Okay, I'll, I'll skip that. And here is uh, where I show you these two uh, books that um, uh, Shimansky and Wolf uh, have co-authored that really kind of are what we have uh, right now. One on border aesthetics, the other on border uh, poetics. I think they very much uh, uh, give us a, a uh, terminology and as it says here, methodologically sound basis. Uh, for literary studies. It's very much focused on, on literary texts. Um, so it gives you specific um, uh, uh, information also on, you know, uh, how to deal with uh, borders in, in, in all their dimensions, so to speak, in, in literary texts. Now, the concepts that we are working on are a little broader. And uh, I personally, although I do identify as a literary scholar, I, 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 I do not really come out of a kind of very strict and, and narrow definition of, of literature, but as an Americanist, I've always kind of had a more cultural studies understanding also of literature. And so I personally find these definitions here very limiting, which is the reason why I think we need another concept and a broader concept that allows us to really also bring in the, the cultural dimension. Yeah, this is uh, um, Szymanski and Wolf are very much kind of um, what we in literature studies uh, refer to, you know, what's going on within a text, right? This kind of textual imminent uh, approaches that you know are still very important in border studies. And there's, you know, it, it is, I'm not saying that this is not important, but I'm interested in kind of the, the cultural dimension, right? Um, if you, you know, remember the whales there, the water, right? In which they are swimming and how, how do these kind of um, uh, uh, discourses that basically uh, contribute also to uh, this literary text or that, you know, those discourses that literary texts um, negotiate um, how do they kind of uh, come together? How do they uh, play with, with each other? And this is where I think that the, the concept of border escapes and border um, um, textures comes in. And I, if you give me four more minutes, then I will uh, present this concept uh, to you. I will also uh, not go too much into detail of, um, of border escapes, but I do need to uh, explain it because I think we need the term uh, border scapes in order to then be able to talk about uh, border textures. Because what the concept of border scapes does, and this is kind of um, moving uh, away the, the center of attention from, if I just now look at it from a, from a literature uh, a perspective here, from what's going on inside of a text, kind of the diegetic uh, uh, level, to the outside, right? And opening, opening it up, so to speak, um, which is, you know, what I think that um, uh, neither the, the concepts of border aesthetics or border um, uh, poetics really do. And to kind of view the multiple layers, not only within the text, but outside of a text and with which the text actually engages, I think this is where we need 
the kind of uh, concept of borderscapes because it introduces a multi-dimensionality, so to speak, to our understanding of the border. Borderlands does something else, and I can't go into detail here now because I still have to, to wrap my, my mind around um, uh, that. But I think, um, and this is something that Christian Wille has worked about, where he talks about uh, 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 the complexity shift in border studies, where we really try to think of the complex dimension, so to speak, yeah, um, of the border. And, um, and uh, Brabilla's uh, concept of borderscapes uh, does precisely that. Yeah, she does not think about the border as a, a straight line here, and it's very much kind of an understanding of the border. If I read this here, which sees the kind of, of the border in transition from a border line to a border area as a border landscape of, of multidimensionality. And of course, that concept of scapes in there is taken over from Arjun Apodurai. Uh, who has used the term media scapes, and there's all oh, there's soundscapes, there's all sorts of scapes out there. Um, and I think these concepts are very helpful because they do draw the attention to, uh, and I read this here again, the increase in connection and the fluidity of symbolic and material life that connect space and time. And the concept of borderscapes emphasizes different forms of interactions of borders, bringing together all of these different dimensions that we've mentioned before, territorial, economic, social, linguistics, and, and cultural borders. Now, of course, the question comes in, and this is my very last point, how does that translate to literature? Wow. And this is the, the moment, if you still have three more minutes, where I think or where, where we think that the world needs yet another concept <laughs> and where we would like to propose um, this notion of border textures. Because for me as a literary scholar here, or as, as, I, as I've just uh, um, uh, defined myself here as a literary scholar working very much with a cultural studies lens here, the concept of border textures really adds a specific way or an approach of analyzing cultural representations, works of arts, and the different ways in which they kind of um, uh, speak to or engage with border, different borderscapes. So in a nutshell, that would be my definition. Um, this is work in progress. We're still working on it and I still haven't finished uh, writing my kind of uh, chapter for uh, this book here that you can already find advertised online. It's a little scary, right, Christian? Um, but the, the, uh, I, I wanted to show you the cover, so watch out for it. We hope to be able to finish it um, uh, early next year. And this is where we want to lay out this uh, complexity approach. Uh, to cultural border studies. So um, here is kind of uh, my definition. Why do I like border textures? I like textures because it brings us already closer to text. Borderscapes, landscapes, very kind of, uh, very much uh, in kind of geographical way of thinking, I think, but border textures brings us, at least me, closer to uh, uh, the text, right? Um, and so I will, I will draw on that. And not only does it bring us closer to, the, to, to a text, but also to the different, to the different uh, storylines, the different kind of things out of which texts are um, made up uh, of when we look inside of the text. And as I've said, outside of the text, uh, it, 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 it kind of allows me uh, to, or allows a text or to, to view kind of a text um, within uh, this web of different relations, different discourses, uh, uh, different uh, reference points and so on to basically the, the, the world outside. The way I see it, uh, border textures, you know, uh, uh, or the border textures approach, as I was, um, would like to call it, actually does two things. Um, and if you look at this third paragraph here, I'll just uh, read this, this out to you. 
and that is it is a kind of um, uh, refers to a potential object of analysis um, but it also refers to as a practice and in particular when we talk about literature it can be kind of an interpretive approach or a way of how to read a, a literary text. So a, a textual approach really uh, to the analysis of the interwovenness of borders, both within a text, but also, as I've said, um, outside of the text. So it is a procedure, as I have it here, that offers a cultural studies tool to work out the different or various interrelationships between aesthetic representations of the border and other discourses and, and practices. And I'll read this very last one uh, uh, to you here. So insisting that the formation of territories, bodies, discourses, whatever are interwoven, thus making kind of the border this is we're moving away from the border as line yeah we're we're uh, we're moving to the border scape so to speak but now with a particular focus on the border as a texture whose analysis necessarily requires a theorization of socioeconomic structures institutions all sorts of uh, uh flows especially in times of um uh, um, uh globalism uh, the act of border texturing as, uh, as I have it here, it's strange to cite oneself, uh, can I think become an important tool in literary and cultural analysis, where then it really transfers to a specific reading practice. And that is that I will look at texts, yeah? And I will try, or with that tool, I will be able to listen to different stories of the border. I will be able, hopefully, to bring out kind of the multilingual dimension, the borderlands consciousness that I referred to earlier, right? So it will allow me to actually um, include that in my literary analysis and, and, and lay that bare, so to speak. Uh, uh, geographers have, uh, you know, referred to this process of kind of digging uh, more deeply as kind of deep mapping, yeah? So it will allow for a deep mapping um, of the borderlands, which picks up on differently orchestrated heteroglossic border voices. So basically that is it, because I come from uh, a North American context and I do very much um, operate with this view of borders and uh, as connected to the periphery. I always also have this decolonial move in my, in my way of thinking, because I do think that borders um, are always the, the, the product of um, imperialist and uh, colonial uh, endeavors. And so I do think that this notion of border textures, this kind of uh, uh, interpretative strategy um, really then also allows us to kind of um, uh, uh, perform an act of, uh, of decolonial. So it is a kind of reading against uh, the grain, which um, in the long run then could also kind of serve as I have it here um, as an ep epidemiological um, unknowing, a kind of going against um, uh, uh, certain systems, you know, that we have now come to accept as this is our knowledge. So in that sense, and this is where I stop because this is where it gets complicated, it really becomes what I would like to call a kind of a critical borderlands practice that, of course, is very useful um, when it comes to the analysis of texts that come out of the colonial difference, yeah, that come out of um, uh, uh, the Americas, of course, but that come out of any um, uh, country, I say it now uh, very, very kind of clearly, that in some ways or another have had to do with issues of um, colonialism. And that actually refers to a whole lot of countries in this world. Okay, I'll stop at this point. I've gone over time, and I'm sorry about that, but I think um, I hope you're still listening and still and still there, and I'm looking forward to your questions, of course. Yes, uh, and we are giving you a royal of applauses. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Astrid, for this enlightening presentation on the right way to understand, apply cultural border studies and border texturing to decoding of literary texts and not only, so different texts. And we appreciate having this mysterious area clarified. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, so now the floor is open for discussions. I have to admit that there are more than 30 participants today and um, it will be quite difficult to find out who is raising their hands like this. So if you can raise your hands automatically, that would be nice. Or at least switch on your camera so and then uh, automatically like uh, you will be on the first page more or less. So I, we will be... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Tanya, uh, if you take a look at the screen, those one who speak, they will appear on the screen. And before... But sometimes uh, people just raise their hands yeah, and they will yeah, be... But uh, <laughs> before, before you, you start asking questions, guys, uh, please take a look at the chat. And if you uh, have not sent us your email address, Aha, okay. please do it because we're going to send the video, the link to the video, uh, to your um, email addresses and then we'll hand it uh, somewhere f f where you can take it. Yeah, okay, please. I'm sorry for interrupting. Now the round of questions. That's, that's, uh, that's okay, so thank you. <laughs> and okay, so who wants to start the discussion? I, I see so many familiar names and familiar faces, so at least I'd love to hear a word from you. There is Simone here too. I, I got a little distracted sometimes because I, I, you know, I knew there was something going on in the chat and I was like, I can't, I can't, you know, handle that at the same time. And then I see, I saw, you know, new names and faces. I'm like, great, this is wonderful. There's so many different uh, people here, my students and uh, project partners and uh, your students, and this is wonderful. Okay. I know this was a lot, but this is kind of uh, our attempt at systemizing uh, this uh, vast field here. And um, if, if you allow me, I will start because the people are shy. So why do you stress the, con the concept of unknowing? So I'm going to the very end of your presentation yeah. and just you stressed it several times and just, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I haven't really developed it yet. I'm fully aware of that. And I always, you know, need more time. Um, I stress the concept of unknowing because um, I have for a long time now worked also with different knowledges. And whenever I write the word knowledges, um, a, a word autocorrect kind of underlines it, right? and tells you that there is no plural of, of, um, of knowledge, uh, just as there is no word um, uh, which is called unknowing, right? And this is precisely the point. Uh, I do think that uh, the, the, the you know, borderlands um, areas are places, as I said before, of innovative, uh, or have always been places of innovative ways of thinking. And they are the places where things are also, or need to be turned around. I think new knowledges are being produced there, have been produced there. We've had, uh, uh, you know, borderlands areas that can be, uh, you, you know, um, certain critics have referred to the Americas as a vast borderland areas. And uh, I mean, I know, uh, uh, Alexandra, you're Latin Americanist. So um, this is also, I think, why I, I wanted to stress the Latin American uh, uh, dimension here. Um, and there is, there is all forms of different uh, uh, knowing and decolonial uh, studies, especially uh, the work of um, uh, Minolo um, has stressed that, you know, there is, uh, especially coming out of Latin America, other enlightenment, you know, it's, it's the other enlightenment. There is, we are very much when we say we, we think, I think, in terms of I think, therefore I am, and this is the Western um, enlightenment tradition. There is other ways of thinking. Uh, I have no idea, and I do see that um, uh, uh, my student from, from China is also here. There are other ways of, of thinking, of, of making sense of the world, right? Um, 
and, and there is indigenous ways of thinking. These are different forms of knowledges. And I think uh, the concept of unknowing is very much en vogue now in decolonial studies. It goes also, also in um, and race and ethnicity studies where we talk about unlearning. Yeah? We have learned so many things. We have, we have, um, uh, we don't question them anymore, right? We, we, a border is here and this is there and so on. But in order to kind of uh, deconstruct the, 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 the term or deconstruct a way of thinking is really to, to kind of clear our mind, right? So it's, it's kind of like um, putting back uh, our brain to, to I don't know. Um, <laughs> and this is what's been referred to as unlearning or unknowing. You know, we have to, we have to start afresh, so to speak, right? We, we need to think differently. And I think this is a, a, a thought that really comes out of the position of marginality, the periphery, the border, where we have a long tradition, uh, also in feminist thinking, for instance, right? Where Kristeva also has that moment when she says, you know, the marginal is an, is, is a, is an exceptional point because it allows you from the margins to look at the center and take the center down. It, it, it allows you to kind of um, engage in this act of deconstruction. And now, of course, comes the question, do you do that within the system or do you try to kind of get out of the system? What uh, Minola refers to as kind of the position of exteriority, you know, that position that we cannot really think that we or can conceptualize, right? The, the other, this is where alterity comes in, right? Um, but, you know, the concept of unknowing is kind of like where we can start from scratch again. And I think the border is the privileged place to do that. Maybe I have a question so concerning the idea of intellectual creativity in connection with uh, Buddhists, right? And um, what I'm thinking about, so, and what I would love to ask you, so to which extent does uh, Buddha, uh, in, or intellectual creativity is connected with periods of crisis or when a specific Buddha is endangered or, or um, so the, like, like we have here, for example, wars on two different borders you know so there are borders we even don't think about them we don't notice them till the moment when these borders yeah. are violated yeah well arguably i mean i think this is uh, this is good news uh, uh uh for us who want to uh not be kind of uh uh, uh taken down by the fact of that there is a lot of violence out there and yes you can you can despair right with the many border conflicts that are going on um at the same time i think moments of crisis are always moments uh in which uh, uh people start because of necessity so to speak to reflect on the current status quo and i think there there are moments of uh and, and we see this right now, right? What, what kind of the, the current pandemic situation also is doing to us. There is such a rise in, in creative energy, right? And in, in intellectual uh, um, uh, creativity going on. I do think that these moments of crisis, uh, of course, you know, even though they have this, of course, a very um, uh, a violent effect, and I'm, I don't want to downplay that, but in terms of of literary productions in terms of um, intellectual creativity, I think there are also privileged moments, and we do see this in 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 world literature. I, but that's my view because I've never been kind of a a person who who liked kind of uh, the mainstream and 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 and, and hegemonic texts, but um, the creative potential um, has always come from from the margin and has always come from the edges of the empire, so to speak, right? This is where, uh, you know, where there is resistance, so to speak. Um, there is also uh, uh, creative potential uh, in terms of, of artistic development. Thank you, thank you, Astrid. So maybe there are other questions. So let, let's join the discussion. Stephanie? 
Um, hi, yeah, it's not necessarily a question, just um, maybe a thought I'd like to add to the first question about um, to unlearn, because I think sometimes we are so set in stone with our thoughts because we are raised in a kind of social environment. And that's why I really think that magical realism, the genre, is so powerful because they do not really, or a book written or a text written in this genre does not really classify between real and unreal. So it's a very safe place for us to yes. being confronted with concepts that are not necessarily normal or thinkable for us. So that's what I think at least. <laughs> Yes, and, and, and you're right, Steffi, I mean, that is, the, and, and, and this is why I, I kind of um, I love magical re realism and why I think it has become kind of the, again, the, the, the dominant um, uh, literary mode, right, for, for border literature. If you look at, at uh, bodies of literature that come out of national contexts that employ uh, magical realism, uh, uh, you see this right away, that magical realism kind of is a literary mode that allows you know you know to express exactly so to speak this position of extraordinary the other side right and it does so within a a, a realist narrative right it's not utopian it's not it, you know of course you know other genres like the fantastic and so on they also do that but magical realism has a realist right setting so to speak in terms of literary mode and then all of a sudden something happens and you can't make sense of it. Um, and it came out of Latin America um, as a lot of these innovative traditions. But if you look at it, where is it employed in other bodies of literature? If I speak of US American literature, in Chicano literature, in African American literature, uh, if you think of Toni Morrison, um, in, in Canadian literature. And what do these literatures all have in common? They're all kind of uh, the, you know, the, the, the legacy or they come out of the legacy of imperialism, slavery, colonialism. Um, and so this is kind of, they, they all kind of are in the contact zone, so to speak, right? And, and women's literature also. And, and these are then kind of the, the literary modes that, that are um, uh, employed by writers to, to express um, uh, this uh, uh, cultural difference or colonial difference, the difference, which is again, uh, very much a uh, Derridian, I think, concept, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Astrid. Um, Yulia Stodolinska, oh, yeah. oh, Stodolinska wanted to ask a question. Go ahead, Yulia. Um, Astrid, thank you very much for your talk. Everything was really clear and like step by step. That was really great. And I have a question. You mentioned um, border literature. And when did you personally get acquainted to border literature? And did you already know that it was border literature? Or after you found out about it, you remembered some text and you realized that something that you read before was actually also border literature? Yeah, well, both. I mean, I. I came across border literature fairly early because I, I, I was interested in, um, in, in Chicano literature. And I was interested in Chicano literature because in a, in a class at the University of Vienna in, in the Spanish department, because I also studied Spanish, was actually on multilingualism or the con contact linguistics as it was called uh, back then. Um, and it was about uh, uh, the versions, different versions of Spanish as spoken in the United States. And because I studied English and Spanish, I was truly fascinated by that. And um, and when I when I uh, looked at um, at the phenomenon of uh, code switching, I thought, well, uh, if this is such a, a prevalent linguistic device, um, there got to be a literature, right? There got to be literary texts that kind of employ that type of writing. But I didn't know where to start. And back then, this is a long time ago, we didn't have the internet, so I could, you know, um, uh, Google it. So in, in the end, you know, I, um, I, I, I came across a, 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 a one book um, of Chicano literature. I couldn't find more. And then I decided to apply for a Fulbright. 
and, and go to Texas. And when I arrived in Texas in, in 1990, actually, um, uh, this was just kind of like the, the peak time of the institutionalization of Chicano literature. And this is when I um, really came under the influence of a key anthropologist, uh, Americo Paredes, whose, whose name I also had on the list, um, who, who, who worked on folklore and the tradition of the, the, the ballad tradition. These were kind of my first border texts, this rich ballad tradition in Southern Texas, which is very much a tradition, a corrido, which very much focuses on, on border conflicts. And then the literature of Southern Texas. And it was sold to me as border literature. I, I, at that time, I wasn't really aware of the fact that, um, uh, you know, that this is something that, uh, uh, you know, could also, uh, happen in other uh, cultural contexts, but I soon then uh, found out, and a lot of you know critics actually would say that uh, uh, most of American literature is actually border literature, uh, because the frontier, the concept of the frontier, reigns so highly in American culture. Right? You could say that the entire literature of the American West is about is about the border. Right? So the border is such an important. Uh, a concept in, in, in American literature. So then it was, you know, fairly easy for me to kind of make that connection. Thank you, Simona. Glad to see you, so. Hey, I'm so glad to see yeah. you. Hello, hello, everybody. I'm also very glad to see you. I'm sorry that I arrived a little later today, yeah. but I mean, I had some personal problems that are now solved, luckily. And uh, I want to thank uh, Astrid Fellner for sh her really inspiring talk now because I mean I was listening so carefully and uh, I was like uh, really surprised for example when she made perhaps the obvious example of Kafka as a border yeah. borderland writer which is really I mean illuminating and uh, what I was thinking about is that this concept of the border texture in a way is like the specializing the concept of border. So it's like translating it and making it more usable also in other contexts that we would not think of yeah. using it. And uh, because the border is, let's say, within the subject that you're studying and, yeah. and that helps you to adapt it and use it as, as a tool in other contexts. And I was thinking that perhaps because I was trying to refer to it because Astrid talks about more about literature and literary tests, but of course, as an historian, I was trying to like uh, adapt it to other kind of analysis and uh, perhaps it could be really useful also, and perhaps, I mean, I know, Astrid, you know about it perhaps, but it could be used also to describe some, uh, let's say, I don't find the word, the uh, informal or non-formal borders, uh, referring, for example, to the actual turmoil in cities between uh, peripheries, once again, to mm -hmm. use your words, and centers between rich and poor parts of a country. Yeah. So that you can use to like a tool to make some borders who are not explicit, more explicit. And I don't know if there are already like some studies who are trying to use this concept to make other uh, borders more evident to make them emerge. Uh, uh, I don't know if I've been clear. Yeah. But, uh, well, what I've tried to do now, because this is a literature conference or so I was told, uh, I really tried to um, kind of um, carve out my understanding of border textures from this literary point of view. Uh, in fact, what we're trying to do in, in, in our book here is really to, you know, uh, uh, present a concept that, you know, will, you know, be useful in various disciplines. For me, history is very important. Uh, and I do, I do, um, if I look at the, at the uh, US-Canada border, for instance, I do actually um, and I love doing that, and a lot of people hate that when I do that. I do love to read certain texts um, in dialogue with each other, or I like to bring texts into dialogue. And I do also um, uh, look at historical studies and literary texts, because they very often, you know, speak to each other. 
And I know, you know, very often people uh, uh, are critical of that because they say, well, you're, you're mixing genres here and one is a fictional text and the other is a, is a historical text. But you know, Simone, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> um, history is also, I'm sorry, from a literary perspective, only his story, right? This is a- Yeah, and, and history is also fiction in a way because it's a craftsmanship of reconstructing the story. So exactly. it's also- yeah. Exactly, and um, and at the same time, of course, we have historical novels and so on. But I think you can juxtapose uh, these texts, and um, and this is how um, if I if I, for instance, were to come up with a border texturing approach of the U.S. Uh, uh, Canada border, which is you know my my book project, um, then then I will need to rely on historical studies, also the economic tradition. I will, this is another talk that I, that I have also given where in zooming in on one particular area of the US-Canada border, um, it really allows me to weave kind of a border texture of that border by, by bringing in all of these different discourses and showing in how they work together. Uh, you know, really kind of performing a, a deep mapping, which is really a listening to marginal voices. And of course, these marginal or small voices of history uh, refer to um, historical, you know, uh, figures, of course, of people, uh, um, um, but also, um, of course, of, 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 of um, uh, uh, well, literary uh, texts that very much also focus on these uh, small voices. I think this is a concept that also comes out of um, of the post-colonial Indian. Uh, um, this, I, I can't pronounce his name now. It's an in Indian intellectual who who wrote about kind of the the small voices of history, right? And I think these small voices of history they can be brought out. Also, we can listen to them. So it's it's a it's a kind of in literature we usually refer to this as um, uh, reading against the grain, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. This is very similar to what we would call in a more historical term something like micro history. Yeah, for a yeah. Person. So it's it's yeah it's similar and it's really really yeah helpful. Thanks. Thank you. So Maybe much. if I can. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add something to it because I think there's also the the um, the distinction between um, macro borders, meso borders, and micro borders. So depending on which scale you're looking at, you can even break it down to between two individuals. Yeah. We also have those concepts which seem similar. Yeah. And it's the beauty of borderland studies that you can bring those small voices. Um, from the margin to the center of the political attention. Mm -hmm. So they're not really on the margins anymore, but really in the focal point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. But in order, I would say, to, to, uh, to grasp or to actually uh, hear these voices, because they're not new, they've been there all the time, right? But they yeah. have been silenced. Uh, in order to listen to them, I think you need to develop a different research attitude. And, and, uh, and this, this also involves kind of questioning your position as a researcher, right? Uh, and how you kind of position yourself vis-a-vis -vis the text that you're looking at. And this is where the, the unknowing again comes in, right? It's kind of, uh, again, if I, uh, I don't know, I'm teaching Moby Dick now. Uh, if you look at Moby Dick, you know, this, this super important work of American literature, I'm interested, you know, at, 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 at this one, needless to say, of course, I'm interested in the voice of Queequeg, that kind of voice which is silenced in the end, right? Um, because he drowns. Um, and, and, and what we have at the end of Moby Dick is a coffin. Uh, and, and I want to look inside of the coffin. Uh, and what's inside of the coffin, right, is, 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 is that secret knowledge we learned this in the text that Queequeg had kind of tattooed on his body. And remember at some point in, in, in Moby Dick, he gets so scared that he will die soon that he actually carves all of, all of you know, these tattoos into the coffin um, uh, that, he has, um, that he has made for himself. And it says somewhere in the text that this is all the knowledge of the world that we find now in those um, uh, red and blue ink or whatever it is, uh, carvings inside of that coffee, uh, a coffin. And that coffin in the end survives, right? 
uh, hanging on our, our uh, protagonist, Ismail, right? Um, everyone is always focused on that act of survival of Ismail, right? No one has ever been interested in the empty coffin, but it's not empty. There's a lot in there. And this is, you know, lost knowledge, so to speak. Um, knowledge that even if they had, you know, managed to retrieve the coffin, and if they had managed to open it, uh, they wouldn't have made sense of it. There is a wonderful example in Cabeza de Vaca, a text I know Alexandra is familiar with, where the Spanish uh, uh, happening upon coffins in, um, uh, in, in, in an area which is now Texas, looked at it, couldn't make sense of it, and what did they do? They burned it. But Cabeza de Vaca, in his narrative, also a border text, very briefly writes upon it, uh, 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 you know, quote, um, comments upon it. And he says something like, uh, and very often you find these gestures in these, in these um, uh, narratives, you know, something like, oh, there was something interesting going on there, but, you know, we decided uh, it wasn't worth our attention, or this was actually going against God's will, and so we burned it. So you know there was something there. And these are kind of the silenced voices um, that I think need to be, need, you know, need to be brought out. A lot of artists do that. And this is where I, I love the, the, the juxtaposition, because for instance, if you look at the work of Thomas King, um, an indigenous uh, writer from Canada, he engages with Melville. He starts right there. He wants to give a voice to silenced quick quick. And so you could say that in his, his artistic productions, he picks up, he picks up this voice. Oh, thank you so much for this new turn for the of interpretation of Mobidik. Thank you, Astrid. Okay, so I have to ask our participants, do you have questions? Do you have comments before? Maybe so yeah. one, one more question, yeah. the last question from Svetlana also. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just I just wanted to ask a question about hybridity because you mentioned it in your presentation as one of the main concepts which appears in the connection with the borderlands. So I wonder, as far as we know, like hybridity as the concept introduced or coined by Popka, uh, well, with his reference to the third space as also a context zone is, well, it mainly involves like this colonial logic. So I wonder, if we can speak about like hybrid, like borderland hybrid, hybridity um, um, is not based on this like, you know, dominance subaltern uh, relationship, but mainly something which mainly undermines the colonial logic. I just um, like, I'm really interested in that. So I just want to hear your insight on that. Yeah, what do you it's, think? A, it's a difficult question. I'm struggling with that. Uh, I'm still, uh, you know, I have a very strong feeling that in, in, in any kind of border situation, there is always this kind of dominant subaltern um, uh, uh, position going on. For me, that's kind of a key, key characteristic of a, of a borderlands uh, situation. Um, and hybridity is a, is a difficult is a difficult term. Um, uh, you know, it comes from from botany, and there it makes sense and. Um, it's difficult because it involves kind of also the way in which Baba has conceived the basically two entities and he's been criticized for that because very often uh, critics have said, well, but you know, you can't kind of say two cultures come together and form a third one because there are no two cultures in the first place. Everything is always already hybridized, right? So how can you, how can you say that there is something new coming out of two other things? Um, so in that sense, it's a complicated concept, but it's also useful because it, it, it refers to this kind of um, uh, newness, which is, of course, important. Um, whether this whole way of thinking then kind of does not manage to go beyond that situation, that I think is precisely the point where Minolo, Walter Minolo and and these uh, new group, uh, this new group of Latin American thinkers come in. Um, and there's also a, a Russian woman, Tostanova, I think, who has collaborated with, with Minolo. Yeah. Right? Madina, yeah, Madina Tostanova. Yeah, yeah you yeah. can pronounce her name far better, yeah. of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that a lot more productive because they really try to, to get at it from this position of exteriority. Um, I think that's the, but that's, that, that's the intellectual challenge 
to mm -hmm. to manage you know to 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 to, to grasp that this is where we like a lot where we need a lot of uh, uh, knowing here right to to, yeah. to you know to to be able to grasp this position of of the outside or what Butler calls the constitutive outside we need the outside right because we need that border you know uh, to actually for us to be able to perceive of what's inside right true yeah thank you very much i also struggle a bit with that so that's interesting mm -hmm. yeah Thank you. Well, I see one more question. One more, oh, yeah, you see, because you are the host, you can see, I can't see. I asked to raise hands it's, automatically. It's up to Astrid if she... People don't follow you, Tatiana. <laughs> if, she, if she has uh, energy to answer the question, uh, then I will let the person, Jasmine, her name, yeah, uh, uh, ask the question. You decide. No, you can still ask a question. Okay, Jasmine, please go on, go ahead with the question. Oh, sorry, my I think my camera is a little bit weird. <laughs> so, uh, um, I have three very very small questions. Go ahead. And uh, first, uh, I saw your presentation. You quoted uh, and uh, simply uh, uh, bo uh, a border is not a border, if I understand right. So it seems like a border study, a border studies are uh, uh, covering a quite a, a, a multidisciplinary discourses somehow and uh, covers so many meanings. And whether a border can be considered as a symbol of uh, yes. uh, many other different, uh, uh, different fields of uh, studies. And then the second question is, um, you have mentioned that the border literature writers and uh, we know there are a lot of uh, immigrant literature writers and uh, uh, also uh, uh, refugee literature writers and how to categorize uh, those writers into border literature writers. And uh, the, the <laughs> third question, uh, uh, I see the uh, border, stu uh, border studies uh, uh, is towards to a global perspective. Yeah. And, uh, I think in Europe, uh, even in America and Canada, border studies uh, of a little, there are similarities, also uh, differences between uh, the country, the nation to nation. And especially in Europe, the border free uh, policy, it seems like the border is no longer a physical border anymore. Uh, so uh, what can I, or what can we expect that the uh, border study can, be able to benefit or in the bigger picture in the future to solve the uh, uh, conflicts or the problems uh, globally. Mm -hmm. Well, I hear, thank you very much, Tesman, for this, for, for, for actually these multiple questions here. I think there's many, many things, many very important issues that you've raised. First of all, this whole question of labeling. Um, I don't want to, um, I, I could have gone into detail there because, of course, every um, uh, discipline kind of uh, has its own kind of labels when it comes to different bodies of literature. So, for instance, border literature uh, or, or, or literature uh, of the border or literature from the border. In German, there is a, um, in, in German studies, as I have learned, there is, for instance, a, a big uh, distinction between border literature and literature of the border. Um, I don't, the way I have used the term border literature is, is really very, very, um, a very broad term. And I don't want to, I don't want to actually um, create a new label for a specific type of literature that has ABC uh, characteristics. I don't want to do that. Um, but if you ask me to do, you know, to, to say what kind of it includes, I would say that, of course, refugee literature uh, is certainly border literature because usually, I mean, uh, the whole the whole question of what constitutes a refugee. If you look at the at the definition um, of, of of refugee, you know uh, this person must have crossed the border, right? Because otherwise you don't become uh, a refugee. So um, so in that sense, there is an act of border crossing involved. So I think refugee literature is is border literature. Um, the other uh, a question, and that is, I think, a, a problem and something that a lot of people are criticizing. 
when we talk about uh, um, uh, border literature or any, you know, uh, a concept or theoretical concept or borderland studies in general and think of it in a global dimension. A lot of Chicano studies and, and Ansaldúa, for instance, in her book Borderlands La Frontera makes very clear that this is a, a book which is very much situated at a very specific uh, area of the US-Mexican border, that is the Texas-Mexican border. And I, I do think it's very important. And I, I recently gave a talk about border scapes, border textures, and a, a person coming out of Chicano studies said, no, you know, you can't sort of like come up with a theory like border textures and think that it can be applied globally. Uh, at the same time, you do have the field of border studies uh, in the way it, it has developed or is developing, really kind of opening up to include a lot of different uh, countries. So we do have uh, a lot of border studies coming out of uh, Africa, uh, a lot of border studies scholars coming out of um, Asia. Uh, if you look at our Facebook group, I think our cultural uh, border studies Facebook group has more than 6,000 members now. Um, so it's a worldwide a global interest that's out there. So I do think that in thinking of borders, we should, and this is why we have to move to, th to the theoretical level, we should develop some concepts and theories that could then be applied and, and particularized you know, within uh, uh, specific disciplines and then also applied to specific uh, regional contexts. But of course, you know, we have to always be aware when we localize certain uh, concepts, of course, that, that we, we look at the particular histories of specific borderland areas. Because of course, uh, borderland uh, areas are all, they're different, right? There's different um, uh, histories uh, uh, everywhere, right? Okay, so thank Astrid, you, Astrid. Thank you so much. Daniel, please go ahead. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you all of the participants who joined us. So we know how packed your schedules are. So we appreciate your uh, presence and being with us. So thank you so much. Thank you for this uh, insightful, illuminating, wonderful, unforgettable talk. Thank Aww. you. Uh, and then on, on behalf of the university, Petro Mohila Black Sea National University, uh, on behalf of our group, I appreciate very much your absolutely fantastic talk you know that we are uh, we are listening very attentively because we live in the land of magic realism you know that in many books uh, I, I read that the father of magic realism is Nikolai Gogol ah. you know, and uh, uh, and we know what magic realism means in our everyday life and I, I I'm sure we will have a, a lot of opportunities to continue our uh, dialogue and our cooperation. And uh, so mm, I, I promise to come to, to Germany soon in spite of everything. You see, uh, because I, I'm tired of uh, being here without uh, coming <laughs> to Germany and, and, my, and my colleagues uh, think, of, think of very, very much. It's the, it has been the culmination of our the highest point of our conference, you know, that was something fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I know this has been a, a large group of people. There are a lot of so many familiar faces. Uh, thank you so much. And I, I so much look forward to continuing to, to work with you, certainly with, with this powerful group of, of uh, scholars in Ukraine and and then my project partners, you know, from, from, from Luxembourg, from Italy, from, you know, here, the greater region, Saarbrücken, uh, Trier, and so on. So I think you're all a wonderful group. So thank you very much for having me. And anytime again, of course, you know that, right, Alexander? Thank you. Thank okay, you. so hang in there. Thanks very much. And uh, please stay safe and uh, yeah. healthy. And we okay. hope to see everyone. I, I, I finished recording. Okay. <laughs>